uh, coming, everyone. Um, we're going to start in just a few seconds, so if you wouldn't mind taking your seat. Uh, anybody sitting off to the side, too, feel free to grab a spare seat. Uh, we'll be starting momentarily. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the birth of a great American, Frederick Douglass. Now, we have a full slate of speakers to follow, and we're also honored to have with us today two descendants of Frederick Douglass, Nettie Washington Douglass and her son, Ken Morris. Nettie Washington Douglas is the great-granddaughter of Booker T. Washington and the great-great-granddaughter of Frederick Douglass. We're honored that Ken Morris, the next generation in line for these two monumental men, will share his story later. 200 years after his birth of Frederick Douglass, yes, we can applaud that. <laughs> 200 years after the birth of Frederick Douglass, I believe it is fitting to ask, why do we remember him? Yes, for his achievements, for what he suffered, for his oratory and his writing, for his principles, we remember him for all of that. But why he of all men who wrote, spoke, suffered, and accomplished? I believe we are attracted to Douglas most because of the kind of man he was. In his youthful years, Douglas was a slave, taught to read and with a heart born for freedom. He was sent to be broken. In that cruel system, every whip of the lash intended to breed servitude was just as likely to sow the seeds of bitterness. When he achieved his freedom, he had no doubts. There was no purpose in preserving a union conceived in the original sin of slavery. He burned the Constitution. Having lived the reality of bondage, he saw the Constitution guarantees of freedom and a proclamation of a more perfect union as a lie. And who here could blame him? How many could endure such evil without giving in to the hopelessness and hatred? But he did not give up hope. He could not corrupt himself with the same sins of those who worked against him. Slowly, he took off the great weight of this distress without ever sacrificing the clarity of moral truth. He came to see our nation's founding not as the protector of slavery, but as the foundation of the demise of that great evil. He grew in the faith that mankind could change, even if only through great struggle. He loved this land, her bright blue sky, her grand old woods, her fertile fields and mighty lakes and star-crowned mountains. No, he could not hate this land. He could not hate its people. He could not hate its principles. As he wrote, I cast all my care upon God. I finally found my burden lift, lighted and my heart relieved. I loved all mankind, slaveholders not accepted, though I had hoard slavery more than ever. We remember Douglas because of that choice, 
because despite enduring great cruelty, he chose not to destroy, but to redeem. And he chose to redeem not through abstractions or ideas, but through action and a genuine love of his fellow man. In the face of those who beat him and whipped him and set up a system that allowed the continuation of slavery, he knew in his heart the words of Dr. Martin Luther King before they were ever spoken. Let no man pull you so low as to hate him. Every American knows we have a complicated history, filled as human existence is with contradictions and with greatness. Yet at the root, America is beautiful. We should demand, as Frederick Douglass did, that the promise of America be realized in full by being pure, purified in practice. But we must know that we can only hold to that promise and make that demand if we, as Frederick Douglass did, love America, its constitution, its principles, and its people. Our nation honors Frederick Douglass because in his struggle, in his life, and in his love, this man once held his property, taught us all what it means to be an American. Thank you. Thank you, Leader McCarthy. I'm Cedric Richmond, Chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, which has 48 members and represents almost 78 million Americans across uh, this country. So today I say to you, uh, good afternoon and happy Black History Month. Uh, I want to thank my Republican and Democratic colleagues who are with us today for this very historic celebration. Uh, our Democratic leader, Nancy Pelosi, is here. Uh, as many of you know, Nancy is from Baltimore, which is where Frederick Douglass escaped slavery. And I want to thank her for her strong, steadfast, principled, and purposeful leadership of our caucus. So thank you, Leader Pelosi. Also, we have here uh, our Democratic uh, whip, Steny Hoyer. Uh, Steny is from Maryland, and he's someone who proudly displays a portrait of Frederick Douglass in his Capitol offices and loves to talk about this great son of Maryland. One of Steny's favorite sayings is a quotation by Frederick Douglass about the importance of investing in education, particularly at the early childhood level. And the quote is, it is far easier to build strong children, he said, than to repair broken men. I thank Steny for helping to keep Frederick Douglass's life and legacy alive in the halls of this Congress. Thank you, Steny. The life and legacy of Frederick Douglass is something that should never be a partisan issue, and I hope that that continues. Today we celebrate the birthday of a man who, like many slaves during his time, knew almost nothing about the day he was born. Frederick Douglass knew he was born in 1818, but he never knew the month or the day. He's quoted as saying, I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it, he wrote in his autobiography. Later in life, he decided that February 14th would be the day that he would celebrate, and here we are, all on February 14th in the halls of Congress, celebrating the life and legacy of Frederick Douglass, just a few minutes away from the home where he died in Southeast Washington, D.C. on February 20th, 1895, and just a few hours away from the Maryland plantation where he was born a slave. Frederick Douglass overcame obstacles that no man, nor woman, nor child should ever have to overcome. He was born into slavery. In addition to knowing very little about the day he was born, he knew very little about the woman who gave birth to him because he was separated from his mother at an early age. The wife of one of his masters started teaching him to read but stopped when her husband disapproved. He therefore had to teach himself how to read. He escaped slavery at the age of 20. He was working in a Baltimore shipyard at the time and disguised himself as a sailor to escape. He's quoted as saying, I felt assured that if I failed in this attempt, my case would be a hopeless one. It would seal my fate as a slave forever. He wrote this in his autobiography. This was his second attempt at becoming a free man. 
After he successfully escaped slavery, he became one of the most well-known leaders of the 19th century, one who fought for the rights of both African Americans and women. Frederick Douglass's story is a testament to the resolve and resiliency of African Americans. From, from property to the presidency, African Americans always make a way out of no way and make the impossible possible. Frederick Douglass's story is also a testament to African American patriotism, which has been in question in recent months. African Americans have loved this country even when it hasn't loved us. In fact, we fought this country in order to fight for this country. And we have throughout history saved this country from itself. Slavery, Jim Crow, lynchings are just a few of those examples. In a letter to newspaper publisher Horace Greeley in 1846, Frederick Douglass wrote, I am one of those who think that the best friend of a nation is he who most faithfully rebukes her for her sins. We would be wise to remember his words now. Frederick Douglass was an American patriot who truly helped make this country great. And we should celebrate his life and legacy today and every day. Thank you and may God bless you. Well, good afternoon. I'm Senator Tim Scott, and I have the pleasure of representing the great state of South Carolina, and I am so happy to see a bipartisan coalition of members of the House, a few senators here today. It's always good to see the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, who's consistently with us. Thank you very much. As I think about the memory of Frederick, Frederick Douglass, as I think about the challenges that he faced, the nation, he lived in a man who was born in bondage, but his spirit was always free. And it was a matter of time before he would experience it physically. And so when I think about our responsibilities today to remember the legacy of Frederick Douglass, it is not simply to celebrate a life lived in struggle and then in success, but it is to remember the responsibility that leaders today have to build upon the foundation that he established, a foundation that focuses on economic freedom and the power of education as two of the key pillars to make sure that this nation lives up to its fullest potential by making sure that Americans trapped in distressed communities experiences freedom, freedom that so many, so many that went before us, died to purchase. I often think about how often, how many nights men and women suffered and whipped, denied education, and yet the indomitable spirit of men and women like Frederick Douglass rose to the occasion and created a path burned not with fire, but with sweat, with tears, and with blood. Those are our forefathers of this great nation. Those are the men and women that we ought to celebrate and then rise up as leaders of this nation and go into places where too many of our brethren still live. To honor his memory is not to simply look back. It is to look forward with the responsibility of saying, it is my responsibility to be my brother's keeper. Mr. Speaker, Madam Leader, Mr. Whip, other distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jim Clyburn and I proudly represent the 6th Congressional District of South Carolina. Speaking to an audience in Montgomery, Alabama, in 1957, Martin Luther King Jr., whose 89th birthday we celebrated last month, 
said this, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? In my not so humble opinion, no American who ever lived answered that question more productively than Frederick Douglass. Born into slavery a few miles from here on Maryland's Eastern Shore in 1815, Frederick Douglass became a fugitive from injustice in 1838 and lived in Rochester, New York from 1847 to 1872. He became a lion of the women suffrage movement and was present at Seneca Falls in 1848. At the International Conference on Women in, in 1888, Douglas urged the men present to, and I quote, get out of her way. <clears throat> and let the women lead the suffragettes movement. He became the lion of the anti-slavery crusade. Robert Smalls, born into slavery in Beaufort, South Carolina in 1839, was enamored with and influenced by Frederick Douglass. Smalls escaped from slavery on May 13, 1862, and made his way to Washington, D.C. Later that year, Smalls accompanied and sat next to Frederick Douglass at a meeting with Abraham Lincoln to discuss the plight of blacks in America. According to the calendar, this meeting took place while Lincoln was contemplating and discussing with his cabinet the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation. Douglas was idealized by many, one of whom was a young man named Richard Greener, who made a pilgrimage, a self-described pilgrimage, to Rochester to visit who he called the Grand Man. According to Greener, it was an idyllic meeting. He further wrote, both the hero and the hero worshiper were in their elements. Greener would go on to become the first African American to enroll in and graduate from Harvard University. In 1873, he became the first African American professor and librarian at the University of South Carolina, which I proudly represent in this August body. As we celebrated the 200th anniversary of his birth and prepared to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s death, let's reflect upon Douglass's immortal words, and I quote, those who profess to favor freedom, yet depreciate agitation, want crops without plowing up the ground, they want rain without thunder and lightning, they want the ocean without the awful row of its many bodies, waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Thank you. I'm uh, Congressman Andy Harris from Maryland's Eastern Shore, one of the co-sponsors of the Bicentennial Commission Bill. Frederick Douglass, of course, was born a slave in Talbot County, Maryland. 
From those humble beginnings, he persevered and rose to become a fierce advocate for liberty and equality, the father of the abolitionist movement, a prolific author, a gifted statesman, and ultimately, a true icon of American history. He was indeed an American hero who left a permanent imprint on our nation's history and is surely one of Maryland Eastern Shore's favorite sons. I'm honored to be here on what would have been his 200th birthday, in all likelihood, to celebrate his life and his legacy. Last September, I had the privilege of visiting the Y House, a plantation on Maryland's Eastern Shore where Frederick Douglass spent parts of his childhood. It was humbling to experience and see firsthand the circumstances under which Frederick Douglass and the other enslaved peoples on that plantation lived. For me, that experience highlighted the awesomeness of Douglass's accomplishments, his ascension from slavery, his perseverance, and his dedication to the pursuit of equality and justice truly embody the American dream. I think it's important to remember that Douglass was more than just an abolitionist. He was a true believer in the American promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He once wrote, quote, where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. He truly understood that America is premised on the idea of liberty, equal opportunity, and equal justice under the law. I look forward to working with my colleagues here in Congress and my fellow commissioners to celebrate the memory of Frederick Douglass and to continue the work toward our shared goals of equality, justice, and freedom. Finally, I want to thank, give a, give a thank you to my colleagues from Congress who are here today from both sides of the aisle for helping to pass this legislation, creating the Bicentennial Commission, to President Trump for signing the legislation into law, and to Speaker Ryan for giving me the honor to serve on this commission. I look forward to working with my fellow commissioners to develop programs to celebrate Frederick Douglass and his life's great work. Truly a lesson for all Americans. Thank you. I'm Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. I represent the residents of the District of Columbia where Frederick Douglass spent the majority of his life as a free man. Because, like many born as slaves, Frederick Douglass did not know his birthday, we commemorate his 200th birthday today, February 14th the day this self-made man chose as his birthday. I am grateful to Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy and a Congressional Black Caucus Chair Cedric Richmond for organizing this congressional commemoration and to fellow members of the Frederick Douglass Bicentennial Commission who will be sworn in today. I thank Congressman Andy Harris and Senator Chris Van Hollen, who with me authored the law establishing the Bipartisan Commission. Frederick Douglass's gifts to our country were so bountiful, so national, so international in scope that we might pass right over the majority of his life as a free man living in the District of Columbia. Perhaps many knew that Douglas built his home, Cedar Hill, in Anacostia in Southeast Washington, because it is now a National Historic Site, visited by thousands every year. But who knew that Douglas served as Howard University trustee, even as he traveled for other issues around the country and around the world? Who knew that Frederick Douglass, as a District of Columbia resident, was a staunch Republican? 
the party of his good friend, Abraham Lincoln. Who knew that Douglas was appointed by three different Republican presidents to local positions in the District of Columbia to the then upper cha chamber of the DC Council, then as DC recorder of deeds, and then as US Marshal for the federal and for the District of Columbia courts. Who knew that Frederick Douglass ran in the primary for delegate to the House of Representatives, <laughs> the position I now hold, but was defeated by another Republican who became the member of Congress, watch out Eleanor, <laughs> who knew that Republican presidents were always in search of new ways to use Douglas's enormous talents, appointing him to serve as US minister to Haiti and assistant secretary of the Commission of Inquiry to Santa, Sa Santa Domingo. Who knew that Frederick Douglass could not live in the District of Columbia without becoming a champion for DC residents to have the same rights as Americans who live in the states? Who knew? Not even Frederick Douglass knew or could have envisioned that the nation would celebrate the 200th year of his birth in view of a Frederick Douglass statue donated by the residents of the city Frederick Douglass called home. Thank you very much. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here today. I'd like to thank Leader McCarthy for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to thank my chairman, Cedric Richman of the Congressional Black Caucus for being such a great influence and, and leader even in, in my life here in Congress. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues that are here also. Today we celebrate a man who was a fighter. He fought for his own freedom and for human dignity at a time where it was dangerous for a black man to rise up and fight. Frederick Douglass was a legend when he was alive and is larger than life even today. And I think it's appropriate that we celebrate him today on Valentine's Day. I want to talk a little bit about why um, I think it's appropriate for us to talk about him today, not just because today is the day that he chose to, to have as his birthday, but the driving force behind the things that he has done. He was born into slavery, and he never wanted to be known as a happy slave. That's why when you see his pictures, he is incredibly stern. He's got a serious look on his face. Even when he lived here in DC, he was known as the Lion of Anacostia, because, partly because of his hair, and the other part was because the people who knew him and knew him well also knew that he had a heart as big as a lion. I want to tell you about the part that stuck with me as I studied Frederick Douglass. His mother. When he talks about his mother, he remembers his mother as a woman who would lay next to him until he fell asleep. And when he woke up, she was out working. She was gone. He lost her at a very early age. But when he was asked about his birthday, he didn't know because he was a slave. When he got to choose his birthday, I don't know if people know this, but the part that stuck with me is that he says that his mother used to call him his little Valentine, her little Valentine. And that's why he chose February 14th as the day of his birthday. Understand that the reason why I think Frederick Douglass is such a driving force today is what drives us is not the anger. It's not the fight, but it's the love that we have, the love that people have shown us in our lives. His mother, his wife that stood by him through thick and thin, 
And when we work today and we work to represent the people in our lives, remember, it's the driving force. It's not hate. It's the love. Now, the one, the one thing that, um, one of the quotes that I remember about Frederick Douglass is he said, it is easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. That quote comes from love. It doesn't come from anger. So we can learn something from Frederick Douglass. And on this very special occasion, I'd like to honor that life, that legacy of love. Happy 200th birthday, Frederick. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Van Hollen, Senator from the state of Maryland, and we're very proud that Frederick Douglass began his fight for freedom in the state of Maryland, and then went on to lead the abolitionist movement, and was a great leader in the women's suffragist, suffrage movement as well. It's great to be here with the speaker and with uh, Leader Nancy Pelosi. Thank you for coming uh, together uh, for this really important tribute and occasion. Uh, to Leader McCarthy and to Cedric Richmond, the CBC, thank you uh, for organizing uh, this gathering. I'm also very honored that we're here with Ken Morris, Jr., who you will hear from in a few minutes, uh, who is the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass, and to Ken's mother, Nettie Washington Douglass, thank you for keeping the spirit of Frederick Douglass alive. Uh, the two of them uh, just returned from Maryland's Eastern Shore, uh, where there was a tribute uh, to Frederick Douglass and his spirit of liberty and the change that he brought uh, to our country. And all of us Marylanders are very proud of that legacy. Uh, Steny Hoyer, uh, Democratic um, whip, uh, as well as Andy Harris, uh, member from the Eastern Shore, uh, and of course, uh, Nancy D'Alessandra Pelosi uh, from the state of Maryland. Uh, and we want to join the nation uh, in this celebration. I also want to especially salute Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, for introducing this legislation uh, in the House of Representatives, and I was proud to join with her and Andy Harris in introducing the legislation to establish a commission on this 200th anniversary of Frederick Douglass's birthday. The purpose of the commission is to better educate the country about the contributions of Frederick Douglass. And of course, that will include his contributions to making a difference in the history of our country and in the history of the world. But it's also important because of the lessons we've learned from Frederick Douglass and how they can be relevant to us today because as a result of his fight for freedom and the fight of so many in the civil rights movement, we have become a more perfect union, but we also know we have a long journey still ahead to reach that goal. And it was Frederick Douglass who said, and I quote, we have to do with the past only as we can make it useful for the present and the future. And that is what the charge of this commission is all about. Not just the history, but how we can make it relevant today. And Frederick Douglass had lots of good advice for us that is very relevant at this moment today. Many of the statements he gave have already been cited, but to add to those, I would add these. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. To suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as those of the speaker. And finally, those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. In Frederick Douglass's memory, Let's keep plowing the ground for freedom and for a more perfect union. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Ken Morris, and I'm the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass. <laughs> and I'm also the great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington. <laughs> And I'm so honored to be with you this evening to commemorate and celebrate the bicentennial of my great ancestor, Frederick Douglass. And I'd like to thank Leader McCarthy and Cedric Richmond for bringing us together this evening so that we can talk about this great American hero. You know, when I introduce myself to people and I say I'm the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass, and the great-great-grandson of Booker T. Washington. Not only is it a mouthful trying to spit out all of those greats, <laughs> but it sometimes makes me feel far removed. And you may be sitting there having a hard time trying to imagine what our connection is to Douglas and Washington. It's like trying to picture what a billion dollars looks like with all of those zeros. <laughs> but many people know or knew a grandparent and some of you may have even known a great-grandparent. Well, that's how close I feel to both of my ancestors. Because you see, my great-grandmother, Fanny Douglas, to whom I was very close, she lived to be 103 years old, and she met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. And my Aunt Portia, to whom I was also very close, she lived to be 95, and she was Booker T. Washington's daughter. And I remember being a little boy and sitting on my great-grandmother, Fanny Douglass's lap, and she would tell me what it was like to know as she would call him the man with the great big white hair. And I remember sitting on my Aunt Portia's lap and she would give me firsthand stories about her father, Booker T. Washington. And one day when I was trying to wrap my mind around the distance between the generations, I had this thought that hands that actually touched the great Frederick Douglass and hands that touched the great Booker T. Washington also touched mine. So in a sense, even with all of those greats, I can say I stand just one person away from history. And I stand one person away from slavery. We're not that far removed from the history of slavery in this country. And as president of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives, we have the honor and privilege to dialogue with tens of thousands of students around the country in the work that we do around anti-human trafficking with prevention, education, and training of educators. And when we have conversations with students, I think they sometimes tend to think, when they look at the great heroes and heroines in the history books, that they lived so long ago, and it's hard for them to imagine that they were living people that overcame struggle and obstacles and rose up to really benefit and help the lives of countless people. And so I want to focus just a few moments on a period of Frederick Douglass's life which really is at the foundation of the work that we do in education with young people and getting them to understand the importance of education and freeing themselves from mental bondage. And that was Frederick Douglass, as we heard, was born on the eastern shore of Maryland into slavery. He was born to a black woman who was enslaved and to a white man, and it was presumed that his master was his father. He never had a pair of pants or shoes until he was about seven years old. He used to sleep head first in an old corn sack with his feet hanging out on cold winter nights because that was the only way he could try and keep himself warm. And we heard earlier he only saw his mother about four times his whole life, and that's because she lived on a plantation that was 12 miles away. For in order for her to see her son, she would have to work in the fields picking cotton from sunup to sundown, walk 12 miles in the middle of the night, and spend just a few precious moments with him until he would fall asleep. Around the age of seven or eight years old, he had something that he called divine providence in his favor happen. And that was he was chosen from among all of the slave children on the plantation to go to Baltimore to be the house servant for his master's brother-in-law. And when he got there, his slave mistress, Sophia Auld, had never had a slave before. And she didn't know that it was illegal to teach young Frederick how to read and write, so she began to teach him his ABCs. But when his master found out about it, he got angry, and he forbade the teaching. And he looked at Frederick, and he looked at his wife, Sophia, and he said, you cannot teach a slave how to read and write, because if you do, it will unfit him to be a slave. 
And Frederick looked at his master, and he heard that message, and he said, if you don't want me to have this, I'm going to do everything in my power to gain it. And he understood right then and there that knowledge is power, and education would be his pathway to freedom. In honor of Frederick Douglass's bicentennial, Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives has published a special bicentennial edition of his narrative, his first autobiography, which was first published in 1845, that the Library of Congress named one of the 88 books that shaped America. And in the same way, when Frederick Douglass started to teach himself to read and write, he started to break free from mental bondage and he became unfit to be enslaved. And he started to ask critical questions about his oppression and enslavement. And he would ask, God, do you mean for me to be a slave for life? Because my master puts on a suit every Sunday and goes to church and in the word, in the Bible, in cherry pick verses, he finds justification to brutalize, dehumanize, exploit, rape, pillage, and plunder his property. And I can't wrap my mind around what I know is the pure, peaceable, impartial Christianity of Christ. And then he would ask questions like, why am I a slave? And why do you own me? You see, he's unfitting himself to be enslaved. So putting the words of Frederick Douglass in his classic autobiography, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, into the hands of one million students, which is our plan by the end of the bicentennial year, to di distribute this book, we want to inspire and empower the next generation of leaders with the words of Frederick Douglass. Being his descendant our whole life, we've had people of all ages and all races come up to us many times with tears in their eyes. Tears in their eyes because they were introduced to Frederick Douglass's words, and they always remember that they were in a certain grade or in college. What they want to say to us is thank you, thank you for inspiring me to be a leader in my church, my community, my school, my business. And so I know the impact that Frederick Douglass's words can have on our young people, so that we can get them to start thinking about institutions. So when Frederick Douglass escaped from slavery at the age of 20 and he settled in New Bedford, Massachusetts, he wasn't happy just to be in a free state and just to settle down and get married to our great-great-great-grandmother Anna Murray Douglass, but he looked back and he saw this legal institution of slavery. I mean, we face a lot of challenges now, but imagine what that must have looked like to say that your federal government said it's okay, it's legal to enslave you and illegal to teach you. Thank goodness for all of us that Frederick Douglass and the other great heroes and heroines did not turn away from that challenge or we would be a very different country than we are right now. And so with young people today, we want them to look at these institutions that in some cases where systemic racism runs rampant and where institutions conspire to keep poor and oppressed and people in communities of color down we want them in the same way to look and say, how do we go about changing things? How do we go about dismantling these institutions so we can be a better country, so that we can live up to the promises that have been afforded to us? The last time I was in this space was in 2013 when we dedicated this magnificent statue back here. And it's good to be back and to talk about Frederick Douglass and to think about this idea that history lives in all of us. It doesn't just live in me because I descend from two people that we've heard of, but history lives in each and every one of you. I had a 10-year-old girl say to me one time, she raised her hand and she said, Mr. Morris, I researched my family tree and I found that my great, 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 great grandmother was born into slavery she taught herself to read and write in secret, and then escaped, became a successful businesswoman and a philanthropist. And she said, so do you know what that means? And before I had a chance to respond, she said, it means I have greatness flowing through my veins just like you do. We all have greatness flowing through our veins. And history lives in each of us, but the future depends on how we carry that forward. And with that, I want to thank Leader Nancy Pelosi for appointing me to the Bicentennial Commission. 
I look forward to serving with the other commission members. And thank you all very much. God bless you all. I want to thank Ken for that amazing talk and all the speakers. Now I'd like to welcome all those appointed by the White House, Senate, and House of Representatives to the Frederick Douglass Bicentennial Commission on the stage to take your oath of office. If you could come on up. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honored and distinguished guests. My name is Kayla Port, and I'm re representing the General Services Administration this afternoon. On behalf of GSA, it is my honor and priv privilege to confer upon each of you the oath of office as commissioners to the Frederick Douglass Bicentennial Commission. Please raise your right hand, and if you would please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear and affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, that I take this obligation freely without any, any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, especially I'd like to thank the speaker, Paul Ryan, Nancy Pelosi, and Stinney Hoyer, Democratic Whip. Nettie, I want to thank you. You raised an amazing son. I want to thank Frederick Douglass. I hope we go from today and for all these speakers, we talked about his life that if we could just rededicate ourselves to looking what he went through, looking what his struggles were, but looking what he saw the greatness in this country and the striving to make it a more perfect union. And I want to thank Cedric Richmond for being a part of this and helping us put it on. And to all of you, thank you and God bless.